Thanks, Rob. Uh, as many of you were aware, the Coen brothers um, are known for making neo-noir films such as Blood Simple and Miller's Crossing. Megan Abbott, uh, one of our uh, speakers you will hear on Saturday afternoon in conversation with Sarah Wyman and Rob King, once asked the Coen brothers about their first experience with film noir. They replied that when they were growing up, they used to watch film noir late at night on television. Like the Coen brothers, my first experience with watching film noir was on television late at night while I was in high school. In the days before VCRs, DVDs, iPads, television was the way to see films from the 1940s and 1950s. I didn't know that the films were noir at that time, but I recognized that there was something unique and special about these films that, these made, that made these films clearly different from the typical Western musicals and World War II movies that uh, we saw mostly in the theaters when I was growing up. The late Supreme Court Justice Potter Stewart famously said that with, with respect to pornography that I know it when I see it. Well, the same can be said of film noir. It's hard to define in words, but like Justice Stewart and many of you, I know it when I see it. So what was it that attracted me to film noir? The central character in film noir is typically a loner, an outsider, an anti-hero. I can relate to that. When I arrived at Columbia in the early 1970s, everybody thought I was from California. And when I went to California for graduate school, everyone thought I was from New York. When I was actually born and raised in Houston, Texas. As a freshman at Columbia, with long wavy hair down to my shoulders, wearing a sports coat, flowery cowboy t-shirt, hiking boots, and a recovery for President Button, you can see why I didn't quite fit in. Thirty years later, I found myself living in the same unique Japanese-style house that Senator McGovern lived in when he was running for president in 1972. At my urging, that house was recently listed on the DC Inventory of Historic Sites and the National Park Service's list of historic places. While at Columbia and due to film noir, I found myself attracted to women with smoky voices. <laughs> as presented by many femme natales. And I learned from film noir that repartee was the key with women. Except that the femme fatales, or the, the female students uh, in the 1970s, were definitely not the femme fatales in the 1940s. Perhaps they were the children of femme fatales, if femme fatales ever settled down and had children. As a result, my efforts at repartee were greeted by the women on campus with amusement, if not outright hostility. <laughs> I often got yelled at for holding doors open for the women. Self-reliance trumped manners. It was a time of the women's movement when ambition and careers took center stage. But the women of the 1970s were not the first to take center stage. They were preceded by an earlier generation of highly influential women. Which brings me to this year's festival, Beyond the Femme Fatale, The Women Who Made Noir. In the next few days, we will explore the important and significant roles that that earlier generation of women had in creating film noir as novelists, screenwriters, directors, and producers. We will screen some of their films, and with our speakers, we will discuss why their contributions are noteworthy in the making of film noir. I hope you enjoy the festival. Thank you.